hype machine. Don't believe the hype machine. We provide survival news for dogs. Don't believe the hype machine. Death of the journalist. To help you overcome any fear of the future. Don't believe the, don't believe the, don't believe the, don't believe the. Good Friday, April 18th, 1930. BBC Radio. Hey everyone, welcome to Barncat Media. This is a show where I talk about books, films, and events of the past and present through the lens of cultural and media theory. In today's episode, I'm going to be doing a deconstruction of the film Captain America The First Avenger and talking about how the film depicts the public relations efforts of big business during the 30s and 40s. I'm also going to be talking about the argument that the film presents for the free market. Captain America The First Avenger tells the story of Steven Rogers, who is a puny yet very patriotic individual who wants nothing more than to serve his country during World War II, but he's repeatedly rejected by the military on the grounds of his inadequate physique. One day, a military scientist notices Steven Rogers' unusually high sense of valor and patriotism, so he selects Steven to be uh, sort of the guinea pig of this top secret military experiment in which Steven undergoes a physical change into Captain America, which is like this super soldier. So after that, he goes on to uh, try to thwart the plans of a sort of renegade Nazi who's trying to annihilate the world by harnessing this ancient cult power. While it's a great film with some really cool action scenes, it has some pretty powerful commentary on uh, the role of corporate America in defending while simultaneously defining the values of America during World War II as it continues to do today. Now before I launch into my analysis of the film, I just want to provide a little background information on the period in which the film was set. Uh, so following the 1929 stock, stock market crash, which plunges us into the Great Depression, uh, there's a lot of public outcry towards corporate greed and a general distrust of the business community that had been so robust throughout the 20s. As a result of this change in public opinion, FDR is elected. He implements a set of economic policies and social policies that we all know as the New Deal. Um, now this is a huge blow to the credibility of capitalism because what FDR essentially does through things like the Social Security Act and the Wagner Act is that he establishes the federal government, not the free market, as the means through which the social and economic needs of the people will be met. So throughout the 30s there ensues a sort of public relations battle between the Roosevelt administration uh, pushing for these New Deal policies and the uh, business community which is pushing for a return to uh, free market solutions. And for a more thorough discussion on this uh, PR battle, I strongly recommend the book uh, PR, A Social History of Spin by Stuart Ewan. And this battle over the American mind uh, basically continues up until the United States enters into World War II, at which point the interests of the Roosevelt administration and of big business become more congenial as everybody is now committed to the war effort. Ewan explains this as... As the mobilization for war forged a reconciliation between the Roosevelt administration and large-scale manufacturers, the reputation of big business began to improve and the corporate role in the defense of democratic principles gained notoriety. So it's during the war that corporate America begins to craft this new PR strategy which begins to equate uh, consumerism and laissez-faire capitalism with uh, these democratic values and principles. And Ewan explains this a little better than I do. A shortage of consumer goods exacerbated by government-imposed rationing made product advertising pointless at the time. Companies instead produced public relations ads that highlighted corporate participation in the war effort while presenting exuberant pictures of post-war America as a society where a cornucopia of wondrous new products would be the birthright of all Americans. And so it's during this time that the National Association of Manufacturers, which is the lobbying group for big business, begins a marketing campaign they call the American Way, in which uh, they argue that the free market system and not the activist government of FDR will be the entity through which American prosperity is achieved. And it's on this note that I'm going to begin my analysis of the film, uh, beginning with one scene in particular that uh, 
really provides some uh, significant commentary on the public relations efforts of corporate America to reclaim the public mind for the free market system. Uh, and this is the scene that takes place at the New York World's Fair that Stephen Rogers and his friend Bucky go to uh, before Bucky is shipped off to go fight the Nazis. Well, last night, I had to get you cleaned up. Why? Where are we going? Future. So this fair, which was also called the Fair of Tomorrow, had this utopian, futuristic theme to it. And it offered uh, its corporate sponsors like uh, GM and Westinghouse the opportunity to not just showcase their latest products to all the starry-eyed consumers, but to really immerse the American people in a three-dimensional space in which they are spectators to this dazzling future being offered up by corporate America. Uh, Walter Darwin, a representative of the National Association of Manufacturers during the time, was quoted as saying, the objective of this exhibit should be to prove to the public the desirability of the American system of free individual enterprise and the democratic way of life. Uh, and so this is kind of in interesting because we have this uh, high-ranking official uh, of the National Association of Manufacturers basically saying the point of this fair should be to uh, sell the American people on the idea that the free market system is the only way through which democratic aspirations can be achieved. Uh, Stuart Ewan continues on this thought, Exploiting its association with New Deal values, the fair presented itself as a strategic public relations opportunity for business to vindicate themselves in the public mind. The fair provided people the opportunity to imagine themselves as part of an engaging and futuristic spectacle. And so if the New York World's Fair is the future, as Bucky proclaims it is, then it follows that it is the ideals being espoused by the New York World's Fair and its corporate sponsors that the troops must go overseas to fight for. And so in the character Stephen Rogers, you have this ordinary American who's just driven by the desire to fight for his country and defend his country's values, while at the same time the film is offering up an entirely corporate vision of what those American values are. Now this brings me to the transformation of Stephen Rogers into Captain America, which is uh, really another opportunity for the film to proffer evidence of corporate America's role in the defense of freedom. And this is really embodied by the character Howard Stark. We first see Howard Stark as a corporate spokesperson at the World Fair exhibiting a uh, floating car that he promises will be available to the American public in just a few short years. Uh, later on in the film, we learn that Howard Stark is also one of the technicians on the Captain America project, and his corporation is also the uh, leading arms dealer to the U.S. military. Um, so it is Stark's corporation that is in large part responsible for not only the creation of Captain America, but also the defense of the United States military during World War II. So in Howard Stark, you have this very uh, convenient and simplified personification of the military-industrial complex. The film goes on to glorify this relation between uh, private industry and the defense of freedom in typical Hollywood fashion by having Howard Stark personally pilot the plane that delivers Captain America behind enemy lines where he goes on to rescue hundreds of POWs in Nazi captivity. Now I'm gonna wrap things up by just talking about how the film ends and again this is a huge spoiler alert so if you don't want the film to be ruined uh, don't watch this part. Towards the end Captain America just as any patriotic superhero would do selflessly sacrifices his own life by taking a plane that he's on which is about to explode and plunges it into the ocean. Now, after a brief scare, the viewer learns that Captain America didn't actually die. Uh, he's just been in a coma for quite some time. And upon waking up, uh, Steven Rogers realizes that uh, things are a bit awry and it's not the 1940s anymore. And so in his cognitive disarray, he runs out of the hospital and he runs right into a 21st century New York City. Now this is important because Captain America is seeing the future for the first time. And so how does the film present the future to Captain America and therefore to the viewer? Well, it presents the future by showing 
Times Square, the quintessence of capitalism, in which advertising has taken on these canonical proportions and commercialism has completely invaded public space. And so just as Captain America had been victorious in saving the future from a Nazi annihilation, so too has the free market system been victorious in delivering us to that future that it promised back at the New York World's Fair. So that's it for my discussion of the film Captain America The First Avenger. I hope this has been an interesting interpretation of a popular Hollywood film for you. And all episodes will be posted to my Facebook as well as my YouTube channel, Barncat Media. I'm a journalist, I'm a journalist.